the truth, and nothing but the truth. This is GBN, the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Amen, we shall rise on that resurrection morning when death's prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Hello, welcome again to Counterpoint. I'm Mike Hickson, so glad to be with you today. And as you well know, B.J. Clark is always at my side. And B.J., it's great to be with you. It's good to be with you, Mike. B.J., today we want to talk about the Bible is the key to salvation. Jesus said on one occasion, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. When I think about that statement by the Lord, in light of what I hear people say sometimes with regard to their salvation, something like, I just know in my heart I'm saved. B.J., how do you counter that statement in light of what the Bible teaches? Apart from the Bible, you wouldn't even know you needed to be saved. I mean, let's put this in perspective. If there is no Word of God, if the Bible is not in existence, I can get up in the morning and look out and see a beautiful sunset, I can see the trees, I can see everything, but that doesn't tell me if the one who made all those things knows about me, cares about me, wants me to do certain things, doesn't want me to do certain things. And so what I need is revelation. Nature tells me that God is, mm -hmm. but Scripture tells me who God is and who He wants me to be. That's right. That's right. And so when we delve into Scripture, we understand the mind of God and the will of God. And of course, Paul said that God's desire is that all men be saved. And then he said, and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's right. So if I'm looking at a beautiful sunset, do I say, hmm, I'm a sinner. Jesus came to bleed and die for me so that I could be saved. And I got all of that just by looking at this sunset. I can't get any of that right. from looking at a sunset, though I might look at it and marvel at its creator. I need more information, and fortunately, the Bible gives that information. What, what about the example? I, I, I thought about Cornelius. Yeah. When, when he was told words whereby he and his household would be saved. Now, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so we can't dismiss Scripture when it comes to salvation, can we? No, in fact, uh, Cornelius was told to send for a preacher. That makes sense because it pleased God by preaching to save them that believe, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 to 21. And it's also the case, as I stop and think about this, that when the Bible says preach the Word in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, that comes right on the heels of what we know as 2 Timothy 3, which says the Word is profitable and it can give you everything that you need. It thoroughly furnishes or equips the child of God. That's right. So, so when we talk about God's Word and how essential it is to understanding Scripture, you mentioned a moment ago the, the problem of sin. And, and we live in a day and time when many people have watered down the whole concept of sin. And there are a lot of folks today that, that don't even recognize that sin is a problem. What, what does the Bible say about the, the problem of sin and the penalty of sin? Right. Sin is revealed in Scripture as that which man did in transgression of God's law. 1 John 3, 4. Think about the Garden of Eden. God gave a law of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou mayest not eat thereof. In the day that thou eatest thereof you'll surely die. There's the law. That's right. Now the law of sin and death says you sin, you die. They sinned and they died in the sense that they're separated from God, from the garden paradise. And the rest of the story of the Bible is about what God did to take care of man's sin problem. But the wages of sin we know for us is death. And it's not removal from a garden paradise. It is the second death that leads to a lake, that is a lake of fire. Right. Revelation 21 and verse 8, Romans 6, 23. Those verses together show us that that's what sin's going to lead to. That's the penalty for sin, separation from God. What a horrible thing to not be able to live in the presence of Almighty God. So true. BJ, I hear some people saying that, that we are born sinners. In other words, we're born as, we're born with, with Adam's sin, tainted by sin. 
How do you counter that? Because there are so many people in the religious world that, that that's what they've been told and that's what they believe. If that's true, then children would be reprobate sinners and Jesus would not be wanting us to become as little children as He said in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3, except you be, co be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter in to the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says that we're born upright, Ecclesiastes 7.29. We then make choices later on, we become accountable and we either do what we should not do or we fail to do what we should do and then we sin. We transgress God's law. There are sins of commission, 1 John 3, 4, right. sins of omission, James 4, 17. <laughs> and so sin is a reality but not, what law of God do babies transgress by being born into this world? In fact, I've got a scripture as you do that comes right out and says, the son shall not bear That's right. the iniquity of the father. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20. No, it's the righteousness of the righteous that will be upon him. And Deuteronomy 24, 16 will say, every man shall be put to death for his own sin. And the children are not yet sinners, so why would they be suffering the second death when they've not sinned? That's right, that's right. B.J., in John 3, verse 16, many people appeal to this verse for salvation, and, and you well know it, the golden text of the Bible, and we read here of the source of our salvation, that would be God, and then the scope of that salvation being the world. But Jesus said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now there are a lot of folks that will say, well, there it is right there. If you want to be saved, all you need to do, according to Jesus, is believe in Him, and you'll not perish and have everlasting life. And they dismiss anything else. So how do we counter that idea? Context, context, context. What has Jesus already said in this passage? He's already said that if a man is not born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven, John 3, 3 and 5. He's not going to backtrack on that just a few verses later and say, change my mind, now it's just salvation by belief only. No. The believeth of John 3.16 is the believeth that believes enough to repent, to confess, and to be baptized for the remission of sins and to be born of water as John chapter 3 shows. And I can give you another great example of this. Paul says we're justified by faith. Mm -hmm. Romans 5.1. But did he mean by faith alone? No. Because when Paul said he's justified by faith, we have peace with That's God. Right. When? did Saul of Tarsus have peace? The moment he believed Jesus was the Christ? No. He believed Jesus was the Christ on the road to Damascus after he saw the vision. He was now thoroughly convinced that Jesus was the Christ. So did he get up from that site with full assurance and salvation? No. He went into the city. He couldn't eat. He couldn't drink. He is anguished. He's praying. He's lost. That's right. And then he's told by an inspired preacher to get up from his prayer and to be baptized to wash away his sins. Acts 22, 16, that's how you call on the name of the Lord. And so faith for Paul was not faith alone. It was a faith that would repent and be baptized. B BJ, would it be safe to say that whenever you read about faith in Scripture, the faith that blesses is always an operative faith. It's always faith in action faith and obedience. Hebrews 11 is such a great text to show that. By faith Noah obeyed, Abraham obeyed, and you see throughout the entirety of God's Scripture, God gave a law and said, my grace will operate when you in faith obey my law. Uh, you see this throughout the book of uh, Hebrews 11. Uh, Joshua chapter 6 comes to mind there at the Walls of Jericho, what was the law? You march around the wall this many times on this many days. You blow the trumpets and shout, and I'll make the walls fall down flat. All right, was there a law? Yes. Was there grace? Yes. They could never have devised this or done this on their own. God had to give it. Only He could. That's right. But He would only do it when they did what He asked. And when they in faith honored the law God gave, then God gave the blessing of grace that only He could give. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you used that illustration because uh, I, I couldn't help but think about in Numbers 21 
when the people were murmuring and complaining and dishonoring God and he sent fiery serpents among them. And, and there are certain principles that, that we read about in the Old Testament, but they're not just exclusive to Old Testament Scripture, but rather they're, they're really throughout the entirety of Scripture. For example, in Numbers 21, same as in the account that you mentioned a moment ago, you have God's grace, mm -hmm. you have divine law, you have faith, and you have obedience. If you would, maybe talk a little bit about Numbers chapter 21 and how those principles are at work and how, as a matter of fact, in John 3, you remember Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Yeah, the principle is very clear. When the people were deserving of death and they murmured and complained, God sent out the fiery serpents among them and much people died. And so they come in Numbers 21, 7 and say, Moses, please. And I have to say this as a sidelight here. As critical as these people had been of Moses, it says a lot about him that he did not say to them, after what you've said to me and about me, you think I'm going to intercede to God on your behalf now? Who Are you out of your mind? <laughs> no, he was very willing to help them even though they hadn't been good to him. And so God tells Moses to make a fiery serpent, put it on a pole. And this is God's word, his law. It shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Now let me ask this question, Mike. After God has said this, what if someone had come along and said, you know what, you don't really have to look at the brass serpent. You can just say the serpent's prayer. Just pray and ask God. And you can even say these words, God, you're so powerful, I don't have to look at a serpent to get you to save me. I'm praying directly to you. Save me now. Save me from the snake bite. Amen. Would that have worked? Not according to verse 9. Because what did God say? When he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. That's right. That was God's law. Did man have to honor that or not? Yes, he, he did. did. Absolutely. So who are we to change the terms of admission into the kingdom of God, B.J.? Naaman was told, you want to be cleansed of your leprosy? Yes. Then dip seven times in the Jordan. What do you want to do? Change it. First of all, he said, I don't want to dip anywhere. I thought you would come out, the prophet would come out, 2 Kings 5, and that he would strike his hand over the infected area and recover the leper. So Naaman's upset that the method he wanted used wasn't being used. And then he was told, if I'm going to dip anywhere, I'm going to dip in, I'm going to dip in the waters of Abana and Farpar, my hometown rivers of Damascus. May I not wash in them and be clean, he asked. And what's the answer to his question? When God says, dip in the River Jordan seven times, that automatically excludes any river that's not the River Jordan and any number that's not seven times. So, did God save Naaman from leprosy by his unmerited favor and grace? Yes. Sure. Naaman could never have devised his own cleansing. Did Naaman have any law of God to obey? He needed knowledge to know how to be saved, but once he got it, what did he have to do with that knowledge? It was the key to his right. salvation from leprosy to take what he heard and to do it. We need to take what the New Testament says to us, hear it and do it. So true. B.J., we're talking about the Bible and salvation, the importance of biblical knowledge and salvation. In Mark 16, in verse 16, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, that's a quotation. Mm -hmm. It's not my interpretation. I didn't embellish what he said. It's just a quotation. So... What are we to think when people come along and they weigh baptism off and say, you know what, you really don't have to be baptized to be saved. And, and we're talking about the Son of God here. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. So how do we counter those who want to wave this verse off and say it really isn't that important? You know, I would not want to be in the shoes of anyone who basically says, Lord, even though all authority has been given to you in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18, and even though I'm supposed to do all things in your name, according to Colossians 3, 17, I have decided, or this group of voting members of this annual synod or convention have decided 
that we're going to change the rules. Now, I'm not the head of the church. Jesus says, Colossians 1.18, and if he says that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, who do I think I am to come along and say, no, 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 no. All you have to do is believe. No baptism involved in it. Friend, Jesus is the one who put water in John 3, 5. I didn't put it there. Right. Who do I think I am to take it out? I'm not going to take it out. Neither would I try to take the believeth out of John 3, 16. I don't believe in baptism only. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in baptismal regeneration that just the presence of magic water will do it all. I believe that one must believe, repent, confess, in order for baptism to mean anything at all. That's right. Otherwise, That's right. it's just getting wet. But once I do those things, then the blood of Christ can wash my sins away. And you know, in John 3, 7, Jesus said, Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. That's an obligation. That's not optional. No. And so, you know, we're talking about what the Son of God said, as you said a moment ago. Who am I to say something different? BJ, I hear sometimes people say, baptism is just an outward sign of an inward faith. I guess the question is, where do we read that in Scripture? We don't read it in Scripture. What we read is the opposite. Baptism was the means of getting into Christ. According to Galatians 3.27, it was the means of contacting the blood of Christ because according to Paul, we're baptized into his death. Well, where was his blood shed in his yeah. death? And you know, think about it, Michael. Does your blood sh circulate inside of your body or outside of your body? Does inside. my blood circulate inside my body or outside my body? Obviously, inside my body. So if I want to get to the blood of Christ, it's in the body of Christ. Well, how do I get into the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we're all baptized into that one body. That's how and when we that's contact right. the blood, and that's how we find uh, no condemnation. It's in Christ, according to Romans 8, 1. So based on what you said, when we're baptized into Christ, we contact that blood, which washes away our sins, Revelation 1, 5. But we're also added to that divine body, which is the church. And how many times have we heard people say, you know what, you really don't need to be a member of the church to go to heaven. How do you counter that in light of what the Bible says? When you read that uh, salvation's in the body, Ephesians 5.23, and you're telling me, but you don't have to be in the place where salvation is? That is uh, certainly not something I'm going to hang my eternal destiny on. When the Bible says that Jesus' blood purchased the church, Acts 20 and verse 28, how in the world could I come along and say, it's not really essential? That would be me saying, the blood you shed on Calvary's tree, it wasn't really necessary. Oh, it was very necessary. Yes, it was. I can't be saved apart from the place of salvation, and that is according to Ephesians 5.23, salvation. He's the Savior of something. What is He the Savior of? The body. So if I'm the, in the body, then I'm among those whom He will save. If I'm not, then I'm not in the place That's right. where I need to be saved. And, and you know what, B.J., in 1 Corinthians chapter 12.13, Paul said, by one spirit were you all baptized into one body. One now, the body. one body's the church, and there's just one body. That's right. BJ, had we been able to interview someone in the first century, let's just say we were in Jerusalem, and some 3,000 people have been baptized into Christ, and we have the opportunity to pull somebody to the side and say, by the way, what church do you belong to? What would they have said? <laughs> that same day in Acts 2, there, about 3,000 are baptized the same day. Did they all become members of different denominations on that same day? And did they all start going around that same day identifying as this denomination versus that denomination? They would have looked at you and me with a blank stare and a quizzical expression as if to say, I, I don't follow you. Which do not, which, what am I what? Look, there was one church and they were all added to the same church. If that church was good enough for them, when did it become the church that was no longer good enough. It never became the church that was no longer good enough. i tell you what happened. Men came along and took the church God made and started adding to and taking from God's Word and started making a church that's not recognizable, that has not Christ as its head. And they're just putting the sign on the door 
saying they're the church, but that doesn't make it true. You know, B.J., I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up, that, that you used that, that terminology, because in, in a world today that is filled with a sea of different churches, denominations, I get it how some people say, you know, how do I know what's right? Is it possible for us to simply be a member of the church that we read about in the New Testament and you just say, you know what, if somebody were to ask us, what, you know what, I'm just a Christian. I know. I'm a saint. I'm a member of the body of Christ. And, and I'm not identified by some denominational body or uh, some church that has been founded by a man. And so how do we get people to see the difference and how do we get people to study and to ascertain the fact that there is a church that we can read about in Scripture? You know, it's the law of sowing and reaping, and no one seems to have any trouble understanding the laws of sowing and reaping. When it comes to physical seed, at Genesis 1.11, every seed produces after its own kind. Right. I don't plant watermelons and get pumpkins. That's just obvious. I'm going to get what I've planted. The seed of the kingdom is the Word of God, Luke 8.11. When that seed was planted into the hearts of men and women in the first century, did it produce a multiplicity of different den denominations teaching an array of different doctrines? Is that what the seed produced then? No. It produced a crop of just Christians, just members of the Lord's church. If I take the same seed that was planted then and plant the same seed today, if it produces after its kind, mm -hmm. what will it produce today? The denominational world that you and I see, it didn't produce that then. No. Why would it start producing it now? The only thing that happened is people started planting weeds alongside of the seed, the doctrines and commandments of men being those weeds. And that chokes out the seed and, and makes it you know, hard for it to grow. That's right, that's right. BJ, as we think about the Bible being the key to salvation, I read just this past week of a very prominent, well-known international preacher who made the statement that once a person becomes a child of God, he or she can never say or do anything to lose his or her salvation. Now, how do you counter that with Scripture? Because when I read in the Bible, I read about the importance of living a steadfast or a faithful life in Christ. Would this internationally known preacher be more powerful and authoritative than Christ? Would he be more powerful than the inspired Apostle Paul? No. So I read my Lord's statements in John chapter 10 where he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I'll give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. But the sheep he's describing in John 10, 27 to 29 are sheep that keep on listening. That's right. They keep on following. What about the sheep who don't keep on listening and following? Jesus makes it clear in John 15 that a branch that doesn't produce fruit, that doesn't abide in the vine, will be cut off and burned. That's not salvation being promised there. No. And then the Apostle Paul. Look, there's been no greater Christian than the Apostle Paul in the history of Christianity. There might be some who match him, but it's been none, none greater, I would say. Paul, what do you think about your eternal salvation? He had security. He didn't live in doubt and fear, but here's what he also said. I buffet my body. I keep it in subjection. Why do you do that? Lest by any means, after I preach to others, I myself should be what? Cast away. Cast away. Literally, the word means rejected, disapproved. All right, Paul, are you saying you could be cast away? Yes, I'm saying that. And that's why he goes in in 1 Corinthians 10 to say, you look at the Israelites, they fell in the wilderness. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Right. He warned that it's possible, it's not necessary, but it's possible for someone to fall. And I would rather trust the inspired words of Christ and Paul than any internationally known preacher. Absolutely. You know, B.J., in 1 Timothy 1, Paul talks about Hymenaeus and Alexander who made shipwreck of the faith. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, he talks about Hymenaeus and Philetus. He said, who have strayed concerning the faith. They're teaching that the resurrection is already past. And then he makes this statement. 
and they overthrow the faith of some. Now, how does that square with somebody saying, you, you can never lose your salvation? Right. And then you add to that him saying, having cast off their, having damnation in First Timothy 5, why do they have damnation? Because they cast off their first faith. What, that, by the way, does away with the argument. Well, that just proves they were never real. You can't cast off a jacket you've never put That's on. That's right. That's right. Okay. How do you cast off faith if you've never worn it? They cast off their first faith, meaning they did have it for a while. Jesus said they believe for a while and then fall away, Luke 8, 12 and 13. And no wonder the Hebrews writer would say, take heed brethren, huh. talking to brethren, lest there be in any of you, you brethren, an evil heart of unbelief and departing from That's the right. living God. He doesn't say well, you never really did follow him in the first place. He said, oh, you followed him. But now you're, be careful that you don't depart right. from following him. What about in Second Peter 2 when Peter talks about those who have forsaken the right way? Yeah. And then uh, down in verse 20 and following, he talks about those who have escaped the corruptions that are in the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And there's the idea of biblical knowledge. But he said they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end being worse than the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. How much plainer can you be? They did know the way of righteousness, and it would have been better if they had not. What was their state before they were saved? Lost. It's now worse with them than at the beginning. How can they be still saved if it's worse with them at the beginning when they were lost? That's the right. Bible is so crystal clear on this subject. God likens it to returning to vomit and a sow that was washed. It didn't just pretend to be washed. The sow was washed, but then returns to wallow in the muck and the mire. That's right. B.J., a minute left. What would a person need to do based on what the Bible says to become a child of God, to be a member of the church, and to go to heaven? Recognize Jesus as the one who came into the world to save sinners, 1 Timothy 1.15. And he came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19.10. And he tells us how to do that. If we believe that he is the Christ, Mark 16.16, 16, and we're willing to take that belief and repent as, or else we'll perish, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Then as a confessing individual, Romans 10, 9 and 10, unto salvation, I can then be baptized into Christ, to put on Christ, according to Romans 6, 3 to 5. And that'll add me to the church of Jesus Christ, Acts 2, 47. And then I can for, live for Christ all the days of my life and someday get to go be with Christ, which is far better, Philippians 1, 21. So true. BJ, it's always so good to be with you. And thank you for being a part of our viewing audience. We appreciate so much the opportunity to come into your home every week. Hope to see you right back here again next week. Until then, God bless. Then we shall rise on that resurrection morning when death's prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again.